Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here on this blessed rainy day. I was called to do the call to worship today, and if you would prepare by opening uh, Psalm 65, if you have your own copy of God's Word. Before we get to that, I have a few announcements to make. First off, I wanted to um, ask <laughs> all the youth to sign up for the youth conference that's upcoming. If you could please sign up and then also inform um, our pastor Adam for that so that he can just keep track of who's going and I think he's also looking over transportation. Don't quote me on that. But yeah, just so that everything, that everyone's on the same page, if you could contact Adam as soon as you've signed up, that would be great. Also, on the back table, there are going to be giving statements um, of, of your giving um, over this past calendar year. You can use this for your taxes and so that everything is in order with your finances as well. Speaking of finances, we also have um, a church financial report. This is primarily for our church members. You can get them by request from uh, Dennis Verhofzef. Um, yeah, just so that you know how we're allocating the money and what it's going for. That would be uh, the best place to source that from. Anyways, those are all the announcements I have for today. If you would please stand with me as we read from God's holy and precious word. I'll be reading Psalm 65, specifically the LSB translation. For the choir director, a Psalm of David, a song. To you, there will be silence and praise in Zion, O God, and to you the vow will be paid. O oh, you who hear prayer, to you all flesh comes. Words of iniquity prevail against me. As for our transgressions, you atone for them. How blessed is the one whom you choose and bring near to you, that he would dwell in your courts. We will be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By fearsome deeds, you answer us in righteousness, O God of our salvation, you who are the trust of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest sea. You who establishes, oh sorry, verse six, who establishes the mountains by his strength, being girded with might, who stills the rumbling of the seas, the rumbling of the waves, and the tumult of the people. They who inhabit the ends of the earth are in fear on account of your signs. You make the dawn and the sunset shout for joy. You visit the earth and cause it to overflow. You greatly enrich it. The streams of God is full of water. You establish their rain, their grain, for thus you establish the earth. You water its furrows abundantly. You smooth its ridges, you soften it with showers, you bless its growth. You crown the year with your goodness, and your paths drip with riches, richness. The pastures of the wilderness drip, and the hills gird themselves with rejoicing. The meadows are clothed with flocks, and the valleys are covered with grain. They make a loud shout, indeed. They sing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in praise, just as the faithful in Zion did, acknowledging that praise awaits you. You are the God who hears our prayers, and to you all praise belongs. We are so deeply grateful for your forgiveness and the cleansing of our transgressions. Blessed indeed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We cherish the privilege of being in your presence, experiencing your mercy and enduring love. 
Lord, your creation speaks of your awesome and righteous deeds. You are the God of our Savior, the one who stills the roaring of the seas, even stilling the restlessness of the peoples, and one who formed the mountains by your word. We stand in awe of your mighty works, finding comfort and strength in your sovereignty over all creation. You, you care for the land, watering and enriching it abundantly, blessing the earth with your provision. The grasslands of the wilderness overflow. The hills are clothed with gladness. So too we ask that you care for our life, nourish and enrich our souls. Let our hearts overflow with your love and clothe our lives with gladness and joy that comes from your presence. In every season, in every challenge, your blessings are evident. Your pastures are covered with flocks and the valleys are mantled with grain. They shout for joy and sing, may our life be too, a testament to your goodness, a life that shouts for joy and sings of your enduring grace and unending grace. To your holy and precious name, amen. Your wounds have 
paid my ransom. What thief can steal my heart's possession? What power can overwhelm my soul? What shame can silence my confession? Lord, your wounds have paid my Thank you. 
Speak, O Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. For our scripture reading this morning will be in Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 45. Follow along as I read God's word. It says, Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, This man is calling for Elijah. Immediately one of them ran, and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave him a drink. But the rest of them said, Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening became very frightened and said, Truly this was the Son of God. Many women were there looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee while ministering to him. Among them was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and then Pilate ordered that it be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I am to rise again. Therefore give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, and this last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go, make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard they sent to set a seal on the stone. I'd like to ask the ushers to come forward. Let's pray. Lord, you are the creator and, and sustainer of all that exists. You have made the universe and, and galaxies. You have formed each one of us in the, in the palm of your hand. You provide each meal for the animals. You bring rain in its season. You govern each breath that we take, and you authorize every beat of our heart. You are the magnificent and sovereign God of the universe, and yet, in our text, you are nailed to a crude cross. Forsaken by God the Father, you who knew no sin became sin on our behalf. You hung there because of every single sin that we have committed. As, as maybe we think back over this past week, we know that, that you hung there for us to pay for those sins as well, to, to pay for the sins of this week, for next week, and for every sin that we will ever commit. You willingly gave up your life and endured the wrath that, that we deserve so that we can know you 
so that we can delight in you and, and worship you. The veil of separation was torn in two. You have ransomed us and, and given us your righteousness. You have declared us justified, sinless, and therefore no longer is there any barrier that remains between us and your holy presence. We are unworthy of, of such a wonderful Savior. Cause what you have done to set our priorities and stir our affections for you. Cause it to give us an eternal perspective. Crush the idols in our heart that, that compete for our love for you and our, our desire to obey. Fill us with hope and a longing to see your face. Lord, we pray for our world. It's, it's lost. Um, I noticed this week that over half a million people have been killed in the Russia-Ukrainian war. Over 24,000 people killed in the, the war with Israel and Islam. And that's over half a million souls that have violently been brought before your throne and have entered into eternity. And we pray that you would bring peace. We know that it would not be a lasting peace, that you know, the heart of man is wicked and wars will crop up again, but we ask for peace. More importantly, we ask for peace in the heart of man, that your spirit would move that he would come into the hearts of uh, people in the world, that you would redeem them, give them hope and faith in you. We pray for our own country, for its leaders, as we're looking at a, another political season and just all that that brings. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to keep focused on you, there, there is no political savior. There is only Christ. And Lord, I thank you for our church. Uh, what a blessing we have in one another, uh, in the refuge it is to, to gather together each Sunday to recalibrate our thinking, to refocus our priorities. I thank you that you are providing for us uh, a new building uh, that soon we'll have a building permit and uh, be able to uh, break ground. Uh, we look forward to, to having that place that we could use it to uh, have ministries, to be a light. Um, I pray that you would continue to provide financially for uh, those needs. I pray that you would continue to uh, help things to move along as, as quickly as your will will allow. Uh, you would provide the resources, the uh, materials and uh, the labor and the weather that uh, things will move as quick as, as possible. Um, we also pray for the, the ministries in our church. Thank you for those that open their homes each week, that the places that we can meet and continue to, to do ministry. Thank you for the leaders that prepare and pray and um, for all that they do to uh, minister to your people. I pray that you would continue to Strengthen our church, give us an appetite for fellowship, help us to make opportunity or uh, take advantage of the opportunities that we have to be together, to be refreshed, to be pointed back to you. I pray for those that are sick this morning. Uh, apparently there's another rash of sickness going around and I pray for those that are in the midst of that, that you would bring quick healing. I pray for the rest of us that you would Protect us, keep us healthy. I pray for this service. Uh, as one of the songs that we were just saying uh, mentioned something about that we would be reverent. I pray that you would give us reverence, heart, reverent hearts that as your word is taught and uh, as we're just reminded of all that you do for us in the singing and uh, the prayers and, and everything else that our hearts would be reverent, that we would be thoughtful of you and reminded of what you've done. Pray also that you would give us humility as your word goes out, that 
it would penetrate our hearts and that it would change us, that we would be shapeable by your word, by your spirit. Pray for Dimitri as he preaches, that you would uh, strengthen him. And I thank you for the offerings that we're about to receive, that you would uh, take those and, and use them for your glory. Thank you for those that have uh, generously given. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit.
and sisters, I trust that our hearts have been prepared to listen and to be edified by God's Word. In our exposition of Luke's Gospel, we are in the middle of learning about the Lord's provisions for those who come to Him. I invite you to please turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 9, the Gospel of Luke chapter 9. Uh, last week, uh, if you remember, uh, we looked specifically at verses 1 through 10 and saw how Jesus provided for His saints as they ministered in their community. We saw how Jesus trained, how He empowered, and how He sent out His apostles to go and serve, serve people in various towns and villages of Israel. He told them, take nothing. Take nothing and just trust that I will provide for you. They obeyed, went out, and beloved, do you remember how you saw how the Lord provided them food, shelter, success, and even protection? The Lord promised them that He would provide, and He did provide for them. And we learned how we as the church who trusted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, how we too must also fulfill His commission of going out and spreading the gospel, the good news of salvation, that we are to be faithful as a church, trusting Him for our provisions, for our ministry. Well, today we'll pick up the narrative from the moment that the disciples returned. And we will see what happened afterwards. It will specifically be in verses 10 through 17, Luke chapter 9, verses 10 through 17. And, and we're going to focus on how Jesus provides things that are necessary for our physical life. Now, let me ask you this question. What do you need today in life? What do you need in life? Do you need nourishment? Do you need guidance in what you're to pursue, where you're to go, what you should do? Do you need rest from your labors? Do you need fulfillment in life so that you could become content and satisfied? Well, listen, all of us need these things. And we will see how the Lord, how the Lord can provide it for us. As Jesus, the eternal Son of God, as He walked this earth, He encountered people with various needs. And every encounter that Jesus had, it was unique. And yet Jesus responded to each person as 
an individual, always showing his love and compassion to them. We will see that again today in our text. Let's go ahead and read our passage, get familiar with it, and then we'll get into our exposition. Luke, Luke chapter 9, Gospel of Luke chapter 9, I will be reading from verse 10. God's Word says, When the apostles returned, they gave an account to Him of all that they had done. Taking them with Him, He withdrew by Himself to a city called Bethsaida. But the crowds were aware of this and followed Him. And welcoming them, He began speaking to them about the kingdom of God and curing those who had need of healing. Now the day was ending, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away, that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside and find lodging and get something to eat, for here we are in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish. Unless, perhaps, we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down to eat in groups of about 50 each. They did so and had them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them, and kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. And they all ate and were satisfied. And the broken pieces which they had left over were picked up, 12 baskets full. Well, this text reveals to us that great famous miracle that Jesus performed feeding the crowd with five loaves of bread and just two fish. In fact, this miracle is so famous that all four gospel writers include it. They all write about it. And there are some important lessons for all of us in this event. And as we go through this story in Luke's gospel, we need to see and believe that the Lord knows what each one of us needs and that He can provide it for us. So that we would honor Him as God by relying on His provisions for all aspects of our life. If we see that He knows what we need and He can provide it for us, then we must honor Him as God by relying on His provisions for us in all aspects of our life. And I propose that we look at this passage under the following two headings. First, we will look at relying on the Lord for our well-being. And then second, we need to see that we need to rely on Him for our contentment. You know, it's interesting. When Jesus taught His followers to pray, He taught them to first acknowledge the greatness of God to acknowledge His glorious kingdom in heaven and, and on earth. And then, and then, He said to ask first for daily bread. Not even forgiveness of sins, but for daily bread. Let's see how the Lord cares for our well-being and how we are to rely on Him. Let's look at our passage. And, and notice again in verse 10, we read, when the apostles returned... They gave an account to him of all that they had done. And so here we see this picture. When the 12 disciples returned from their missionary journey that they were out for a considerable, considerable amount of time, when they returned, they were excited to share all about what they've done and how they taught the gospel to others. How they taught about the kingdom of God and how people responded. Now, all of this, it took place in Galilee. Now, Galilee was a region that was over a thousand square miles. Its villages 
were mostly around the Sea of Galilee. There was a northern Galilee, southern Galilee, so on and so on. Jesus, uh, he meets his returning disciples in Capernaum, most likely in Capernaum. In Capernaum, according to Matthew chapter 4, verse 13, it became Jesus' ministry hub. He settled in Capernaum, probably at Simon Peter's home. Now, going back to our text, uh, we read that immediately taking them with him, he withdrew by himself to a city called Bethsaida. So Jesus takes his 12 disciples alone. Notice he takes them alone, and he goes over to the area of Bethsaida. Now, Bethsaida was a town that was northeast of the Sea of Galilee. It was east of the Jordan River. The name Bethsaida means house of fish, house of fish. Now, according to John chapter 1, verse 44, Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 44, Bethsaida used to be the hometown of Peter, Andrew, and Philip. They all used to live in Bethsaida before they moved to Capernaum. Later on, uh, in Luke chapter 10, verse 13, we will see how Jesus singles out Bethsaida and Kerosene as deserving a greater judgment than Tyre and Sidon. You see, in the Old Testament, God pronounced devastating judgment on Tyre and Sidon for their extreme wickedness. But Jesus prophesied that Bethsaida, Bethsaida would receive a greater judgment because even though they experienced Jesus' miracles, they didn't believe in Him as the Messiah. And so they deserve a greater judgment. Well, how did Jesus and his disciples go there? How did they go over to Bethsaida? Well, according to Mark's gospel, Mark, he records the same incident. And in Mark chapter 6, verse 32, we see that Jesus tells his disciples to get into a boat. And this was probably Simon Peter's boat. Get into a boat and then go through the Sea of Galilee. But why did Jesus choose to travel on a boat? He knew that his disciples, they were weary, they were tired, they were exhausted from their ministry journey. And he wanted them to have rest. You see, Jesus was constantly surrounded by those who were seeking him for their needs. And according to Mark chapter 6, verse 30 and 31, there were many people who were coming and going constantly to the point of being so busy that the disciples, they didn't even have time to sit down and eat. That's how busy Jesus was. And by taking them on the boat, just them and him, Jesus wants to give them rest and refreshment. You see, it was the time for them to go on a retreat away from the crowds. And I want you to notice here how the Lord cares for his disciples, how he provides them rest. When the disciples were alone with Jesus, they reflected on their relationship with God, on their relationship with the Lord, and they were also refreshed to continue to do the Lord's work. Christian, as we minister in fulfilling the Lord's will for us, as we fulfill the Lord's commission, as we fulfill being godly parents, godly spouses, as we As we do the Lord's work, we too will get tired. There will be times where we'll need to spend time alone with the Lord. And notice how how important it is for us to have that. Only the Lord can provide us rest. And we see here in this passage that He cares for the souls 
those who minister, those who care for, for others. He cares for us. He'll provide rest for us in this life. We could trust Him. We could rely on Him. But more importantly, beloved, we need to also know this, that He will provide for us ultimate and eternal rest in the kingdom of heaven. This passage demonstrates the Lord's knowledge of our weariness and the Lord's ability to provide rest for us. And we need to rely on Him to provide us rest. As Jesus and His disciples, as they sailed off, look at verse 11 and notice of our text, notice that the crowds, they heard where Jesus was going. Being aware of it, according to Mark chapter 6, verse 33, they decided to run there on foot. Uh, they wanted to catch up with Jesus in Bethsaida. Now, uh, this was quite amazing because, first of all, it was a journey from Capernaum to Bethsaida. It was, you know, it was a journey. Also, they had to cross the Jordan River. Not too easy. Moreover, since they came from all cities, it, it indicates that as they ran, they must have spread the news about Jesus. All that they've seen and where he's going right now. Now, Mark records that the crowds, they got to the shore of Bethsaida before Jesus and his disciples arrived. And this indicates that Jesus intentionally stayed at the Sea of Galilee for some time. He wanted to make sure that his disciples got sufficient rest. Now, Bethsaida was a little bit off the coast of the Sea of Galilee. It was not right at the, at the shore. It was a little bit off. And when we, when, we, when we hear or when we read that Jesus arrived at Bethsaida, we need to understand, we need to keep in mind that they arrived at the vicinity, at the general area of Bethsaida. This will be the place where Jesus will perform his great feeding miracle. Now, amazingly, as Jesus and his disciples, as they come to the shore, they see this massive, massive crowd. And look at verse 11. Verse 11 says that Jesus welcomed them. Welcomed them. And this means that the disciples' rest wasn't too extensive. It wasn't super long because very soon after, once again, they are surrounded by needy people, people who are hurting, people who are, who are seeking Jesus and are wanting Him to minister to them. Now notice how Jesus is always ready to welcome all those who seek Him, those who come to Him. And this is consistent with what he'll say in John chapter 6, verse 30, 37. Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. So, beloved, regardless if we think that this crowd was kind of rude, if this crowd was intrusive, regardless of our thoughts of this crowd, Jesus always compassionately welcomes those who seek Him. He welcomed them. Why? Because He knew that they needed Him. They needed divine guidance from Him. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, Jesus, uh, seeing crowds, He showed compassion and said that they were as though they're distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. This is Jesus' compassion towards crowds that were seeking him because they needed him. Look at how much he cares for people, for the hurting. Well, let's go back to our text. So Jesus arrives towards in the vicinity of Bethsaida. And what does Jesus do then? Well, look again at verse. 
verse 11, our text, verse 11. Verse 11 says, And welcoming them, he began speaking to them about the kingdom of God. So just as he was doing this in Capernaum, he again began teaching the, gra- the crowd about the kingdom, the glorious kingdom of God. You see, Jesus knew that they needed to know how to live their lives to inherit the kingdom of God, and he provided it for them. He provided that guidance to them. And by doing so, Jesus was telling them, he was telling the crowds that their current lives, they are so inferior to what will take place in the Lord's kingdom. This is all temporal. This is a life of suffering. There's an eternity coming, a glorious kingdom. He taught how God is holy. He taught how men are sinful and how they needed to believe in him as the promised Messiah to be in God's kingdom. Just like in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 20, Jesus emphasized the need for everyone to see themselves as poor and needy. Using the Old Testament, he proclaimed the sovereign reign of God. He called people to repentance and to live lives that are worthy of the Messiah's kingdom. And here we see that out of all the things that people needed, Jesus discloses that everyone's most important need was to know about how to enter God's kingdom. That is the most important need. And he provided them the good news. And he invited them to enter. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Are you lost today? Do you need guidance? Come to Jesus in faith. For only he can provide for you his glorious kingdom. Listen, this glorious kingdom, it begins here on earth, but it also extends into eternity. What else did the Lord provide for them that day? Well, in verse 11, we also see that he provided healing to all who needed healing. The Greek word for healing is therapia from which we get the English word therapy. This includes all physical and emotional restoration. Uh, You see Apostle John who records the same same incident in John chapter 6 verse 2. He discloses that this crowd followed Jesus to Bethsaida because they saw miracles that he was performing specifically to those who were sick, those who were hurting. Jesus had compassion, not only for people's souls, but also even for their bodies, physical bodies. The fall in the Garden of Eden, it brought suffering, it brought death. But seeing people suffer, Jesus, the eternal Son of God, the Creator, He was moved on that day to remove it from those who came and sought him. He chose to remove that suffering from them. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that if you come to him, he'll remove all your your ailments immediately. That's not what I'm saying. I mean, he can. Sometimes he does. But listen, what this does mean is that he will grant you ultimate and eternal healing. He promised to provide healing to everyone who will be part of his eternal kingdom, the kingdom of God. This incident of Jesus' healing, it, it proves again, once again for us, that Jesus is a compassionate Savior. He cares 
And also, it shows us that the Lord is sufficient for anything that you're facing. So whatever is causing you today sorrow, whatever is causing you pain and suffering, remember that He can and He will heal you. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 says that in His eternal kingdom, the Lord will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no longer any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. Complete healing. Only the Lord can do this. And so question, what are you relying today for your well-being? What are you relying today for your well-being? Don't you see that everything in this world... It's broken. It's unreliable. Come to Jesus. Rely on Him. Well, seeing how we're to rely on the Lord for our well-being, let's now turn our attention to how we're to rely on Him for our contentment. First of all, what is contentment? Contentment is a state of not lacking. It's a state where one is happy where one is fully satisfied. My beloved, we all want to be content. We want things, the necessities of life, such as food, shelter, peace. Look at verse 12 of our text. It says, Now the day was ending, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away, that they may go into the surrounding villages and countryside and find lodging and get something to eat. For here... We are in a desolate place. Since according to uh, John chapter 6, the Gospel of John chapter 6, this event take, took place right before the Jewish Passover, we can confidently know that this happened around mid-April. And during that time of year in Palestine, the sun sets around 6 p.m. And so with, you know, this phrase, the day ending... With the day ending, this means that this happened sometime late afternoon, possibly around 4.30 p.m. or so. And by this time, everyone is be was beginning to get hungry. But the disciples, they, they're seeing Jesus continuing to teach, continuing to heal. They're becoming concerned. And so they told Jesus to send the crowd away. Why? Because they're in a desolate place. A uh, desolate place, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were in a desert, like just where there's only hot sand and nothing else. No, instead it means that they were in the wilderness. As a matter of fact, according to John chapter 6, verse 10, uh, we see there that there, were, there was plenty of green grass. Plenty of green grass. But since they were outside of Bethsaida, the crowd had to still find lodging and food. And so the disciples are thinking, it's time. Send them away. And notice here that the disciples are figuring to help Jesus to be a little more considerate of the people and their needs. Notice how all 12 had consulted together, how they agreed that Jesus needs to send the crowd away. And so our text says that all 12, they all came to him, to Jesus with the same concern. Now this point will become significant when we look at verse 17. But just keep that in mind, that all 12 were in agreement that Jesus needs to send them away. Moreover, their statement, it was more than just a suggestion. It was a critical remark of their discontentment with Jesus' lack for the crowd's contentment. They were discontent because Jesus didn't care for the people's contentment. But keep in mind, by this point, they had been with Jesus for over a year. They saw him perform countless number of miracles. 
Every time they encountered someone who had a need, Jesus would help them out. There was not a single case where someone needed help from Jesus and Jesus wasn't able to provide that for them. But seeing such massive crowd, suddenly, suddenly, they, they lacked faith that Jesus was sufficient to provide nourishment for this crowd. Well, Jesus was considerate, and he was about to teach his disciples a lesson about how everyone could become content. Look at verse 13 of our text. We read, but he said to them, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. Uh, Jesus' response uh, at first, it may have seemed to be discon disconnected from reality. What are you talking about, Jesus? They must have been surprised to hear Jesus say this. But it, sh but it also should have reminded them of how Jesus told them to go on their missionary journey and not to take anything with them because he will provide for them food. Remember last week? He said, go, go. Do not take anything with you. No bread, no, no, no money bag, nothing. And they were fed by others. And now Jesus is saying, you feed those who came. But where would they get so much food? To feed this crowd. That wasn't an easy task. That was impossible. And so look at how the apostles responded. We, we read here, and they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless perhaps we go and buy food for all these people. According to Gospel of John chapter 6, verse 8 and 9, there it says that Andrew, one of Jesus' disciples, Andrew, which was Peter's Simon Peter's brother, he found the lad, he found a young boy who had five breads, five barley loaves, and two fish. So five barley loaves of bread and, and two fish. Now the barley loaves would have been flat, they would have been round. The fish were probably from the Sea of Galilee. But that wasn't enough to feed even some of the people in the crowd. What is that? For this massive crowd. In verse 14, we see that there were about 5,000 men plus women and children. So the crowd could have been 10,000 or more easily. Some estimates have it at 20,000. 5,000 men, not including women and children. Now, quick math would just suggest that you would divide one bread among a thousand men, not including women and children. And one fish, you would divide it among five, uh, two and a half thousand men, not including women and children. In disciples' thinking, in their logic, this wasn't even an option. What are you talking about? And someone from the disciples asked Jesus, and I think this was probably done sarcastically. Someone asked Jesus if he wanted them to go and buy food for this whole crowd. That wouldn't be easy either, would it? Think about putting yourself in that situation. Can you imagine carrying so much food? Well, in another gospel, Jesus asked Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? Now, this he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. And in a state of disbelief, Philip said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. So 200 denarii, this was nearly a year's wage for a common laborer in Israel. And that would only be enough for everyone to receive very little, just a tiny bit. Well, the disciples' reaction, it, it showed their inadequacy to provide food for such a crowd. It showed that they were frustrated. They weren't interested in truly figuring out a way to feed 
all these people, all these people. It also showed that their power and authority. Remember, uh, we saw last week that Jesus gave them earlier to perform miracles, cast out demons. That authority by this point had ceased. They lacked the ability to provide what people needed. In John chapter 6, we see that this event happened right before Jesus teaches the crowd that he's the bread that came from heaven, that he's manna from heaven. And everyone who partakes in him will have eternal life. And before we look at what happened next, I want to remind us, church, that we are called, we are called to feed others with the bread of heaven. That is Jesus and the gospel message. This is our duty. And do we realize that this world that we're in, this is a wilderness. There are many souls that are lacking contentment. And listen, unless they taste Jesus, unless they partake in the true bread of life, they will never be fulfilled. All the things that the world offers is useless. It will never satisfy them. And so they'll continue to be hungry. They'll continue to be thirsty. And they'll continue to be dissatisfied. Think about those who had it all in this life and who ended their life by suicide. Why? What, did they, what were they lacking they were chasing finances, homes, cars. They got it all. And it's all vain. Nothing. It didn't satisfy. They, they remained dissatisfied. They need Jesus. They need the Lord. And we are to spread the gospel message. We are to feed them with this bread of heaven. But do we realize, do we understand that in ourselves, in ourselves, we cannot provide anyone with anything? Do we, do we rely, do we truly rely on the Lord's provision for us to spread the gospel? Like we saw last week, the Lord has to empower us. The Lord has to give us this ability to preach and teach and help those who are hurting Today we see that the Lord empowers us to share Christ's word so that others would follow him, so that they would feed on him, and so they would be content. Well, then Jesus instructs his disciples, going back to our text, he, we see here that he tells them, have them sit down to eat in groups of about 50 each. So the crowd was standing all around Jesus, but now they needed to sit. In their culture, they would typically recline during their dinners. But there was also a very practical reason for having them sit down in groups of 50. By sitting in groups of 50, it would make it easier for the disciples to go among the crowd and to serve them their meal. But the obvious question that the disciples had was, Serve what? What are we supposed to feed them with? They just said they had nothing. They had nothing. Nevertheless, look at verse 15. It says they did so, and they had them all sit down. So the disciples obeyed. They went around the crowd. I imagine they were shouting, saying that the master wants all of you to sit down and get into groups of 50. And we see that the crowd obeyed also. The crowd obeyed Jesus and they sat down. Now, why did Jesus instruct them to sit down specifically in the groups of 50? Why specifically in groups of 50? You know, when I was looking at this text in the original Greek, and when I saw the Greek word for 50, the word pentakonta, it suddenly reminded me of the word Pentecost. And so I I was reminded of Pentecost and the fact that Pentecost was a festival of 
thanksgiving for the wheat harvest. Well, there's a connection here. Wheat harvest and serving bread. And so I believe that Jesus may have foreshadowed here the birth of the church, which will take place on the day of Pentecost, the day of the wheat harvest, 50 days after he will be sacrificed as the Lamb of God. You see, during Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down and empowered Jesus' followers to spread the gospel, to spread the bread of life, to provide spiritual nourishment to others. Now look at verse 16. Verse 16 says, Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them. First of all, notice here that Jesus made sure that everyone sat down before he prayed. He made sure that everyone sat before he prayed. But also, looking up to heaven as he prayed, Jesus spoke to his eternal Father, who is above our universe. And he demonstrated how we are to acknowledge God as the source of all of our provisions. He took the five loaves. He took the two fish and he blessed them. Now some believe that we are to bless our food before we eat it so that the food will not harm our bodies. But the blessing here was just an expression of gratitude. Jesus thanked his father. He thanked his father for his provisions. Now look at verse 16 again. Verse 16 says, He blessed them and broke them and kept giving them to the disciples to set before the people. So he took five breads, two fish that were in the crowd, and he broke them. And you see this clause that he kept giving them to the disciples? This is in the imperfect tense, which means it's a continual action. It's an ongoing process. Ongoing process. He kept breaking them into pieces. He kept giving them to the disciples. The the food, it multiplied in his divine hands. He kept producing more and more. This was a miracle that only God the creator could do. And so the disciples, they came to Jesus with baskets. Uh, Having a fishing boat right there behind them on the shore, they probably had fish baskets. In addition, people may have brought some baskets with them. Well, as one basket would become full, uh, one of the disciples would then take and carry it and set it in the midst or in the middle of one group of, of the crowd, right, of people. Then another disciple would approach with another basket, which again Jesus would fill and he would take it to another group and so on and so on. The pieces, they, they grew under Jesus' touch. And whenever the disciples came back to Jesus, they always found his hands full with fish and bread. There was more and more pieces to break off, and Jesus just kept filling the baskets for distribution. Now, how much food would you need to feed this crowd? Well, I guess we we can't really exactly know because we really don't know the exact crowd and the, the statistics of the crowd, how many children, how many adults. However, according to one very conservative estimate, you would need at least 8,000 pounds. And and again, this is just hypothetical, but at least 8,000 pounds. Even if so, 8,000 pounds of food is four tons of food. Four tons. And Jesus, he performed this creation miracle in front of everyone's eyes. I look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, And they all ate and were satisfied. Look, Jesus didn't just give the crowd a taste. Oh no. He gave enough for all of them to be fully satisfied. Not a single person was left unfed. All became full and content. Look at our text again. 
It says, and they all ate and were satisfied, and the broken pieces which they had left over were picked up. There was more than enough for everyone to the point of that there were pieces that were left over, pieces that couldn't be eaten. Everyone was so full, they said, no, that's okay, I, I don't need any more. Uh, and they had pieces that were left over. Jesus provided beyond all their needs. And then the Lord instructed his disciples to gather what was left. The Lord didn't want food to go to waste. He didn't want food to go to waste. So the disciples picked up all the pieces that couldn't be eaten. And how much leftovers did the disciples gather? Our text says 12 baskets full. 12 baskets full. An hour ago, remember? Remember I said this will be important in verse 17? An hour ago, 12 disciples consulted and agreed that Jesus needs to send the crowd away. Now, they shockingly stood before Jesus, right beside him, each one holding a basket full of fish and bread. I believe the Lord did this not only to provide them food also, but also for them to learn a lesson about relying on Him for provisions. And so the Lord provided food for the crowd just as He provided for His disciples, His apostles, when He sent them out on their missionary journey. And the disciples were again reaffirmed that their Lord can provide for everyone's needs. Despite their lack of devotion, despite their lack of faith, He proved that He is God. He proved that He can make everyone satisfied. The 12 disciples in that moment, they, they were foolish to misjudge Jesus, to think that He had no compassion, that He wasn't able to provide for them. They were foolish. Not only can He provide physical bread for infinite number of people, he himself is the bread of life who continues to satisfy everyone who comes to him today. Well, we began today's message with the disciples telling Jesus all about what they have done in their missionary journey. And we'll end with them seeing and participating with him in feeding this massive crowd. Just like He provides His ministering church empowerment, resources, success, and protection, He provides His people all that they need for their well-being and contentment. Being God, He can create light out of darkness. He can create order out of disorder, strength out of weakness, joy out of sorrow, and nourishment out of nothing at all. What are we to do if you're lacking? What are we to do if you're lacking? God's Word tells us you do not have because you do not ask. How foolish are we when we depend on our own strength, on our own abilities for our provisions? We are no different than the disciples who acted in our text like they had no hope. Instead, we need to believe in the Lord and we need to pray. Pray for Him to provide for us daily. You see, with this miracle, Jesus again demonstrated His compassionate care for those who come to Him. All throughout Luke's gospel, we're seeing Jesus' love, Jesus' care for those who come to Him. And again, we see it today. And this, again, reminds us of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, which says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. He sympathizes with our weaknesses. He cares for our well-being. He cares for our contentment. 
Now, this doesn't mean that He will provide for us everything that we want, for there are some things that we want that may not be in line with His will for us. But it does mean that He knows and He will provide for us all that we need. He knows and He'll provide all that we need. Well, what if you're not a believer today? What if you, what if you haven't yet ran to Him? What if you haven't sought Him yet? Then you are lacking contentment. Now, how do I know this? How can I say for sure that you are lacking contentment? Because Scripture tells us that we were created to need God to be fully content. If you don't have the Lord, you will never be content. Regardless of all the things that you accumulate and achieve, you will still be dissatisfied in the end. Moreover, you're facing an eternity of suffering in hell. Did the Holy Spirit open your eyes today to see Jesus as the source of your well-being, as the source of your contentment? If so, then run to Him. Run to Him in faith. Surrender to Him as Lord. Only He can save you from eternal judgment. Only He can give you full satisfaction. Well, beloved, the last two weeks, we saw the compassion of our Lord and His power to provide everything that we need. May we truly honor Jesus today. May we honor Him as God. How? By relying on His provisions for our life and ministry. If you're willing and able, can I ask you to rise? Father, we thank You that You have again reminded us of of your genuine care for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you showed your compassion in practice and that you can provide all that we need. And we thank you that we have the source. May we truly run to you for our satisfaction, for our contentment, for our well-being. May we remember your promises and be patient and to know that all things work together for good. And Lord, we pray that you would help us that you would empower us to feed others this bread of heaven, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in his name. Amen. My heart is filled with
to love and follow Him. Dismiss us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God that provides and that everything that you have provided is exactly what we need. I pray that you would help us not to strive for the things of this world, but to to strive to know you more, and that we would trust in you for your provision for our salvation, uh, for your provision for our tangible needs, for you are a great provider. Amen.